Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll start in about two or three minutes. Hope you can hear, hear me clearly. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Supriya Goswami, and I head marketing for India and Southeast Asia at Inmobi. I want to welcome all of you to our webinar under the Indicode series uh, hosted by Inmobi. So, very quickly, a little bit, a brief introduction about Inmobi. Inmobi enables consumers to discover new products and services by providing contextual and curated recommendations on mobile devices. Through our revolutionary discovery and advertising platform, developers, merchants, and brands can engage mobile consumers globally. We have been recognized by Fast Company as one of 2016's most innovative companies in the world and have a reach of over 1.56 billion unique unique mobile devices worldwide. Uh, just a little bit. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. If you can, you can just raise your hand on. Okay. Great, thanks. I can see some hands raising. Okay, great. And uh, uh, so, as I was sharing about uh, Inmobi, we're the third largest, third largest mobile advertising platform after Google and Facebook. Um, with 200, we serve 200 billion plus impressions per month, and our platform actually ingests more than 13 billion events every single day. So, truly, a global reach at scale with local service is what Inmobi is able to provide. Um, I also wanted to introduce Indicode to you. Um, Indicode is InMovie's uh, developer evangelism program, as part of which we host a series of events, meetups, and webinars across the globe. The Indicode philosophy is all about giving back to the developer community in terms of best practices and learnings, and not really about promoting InMovie's products or services. We invite speakers to engage with app developers, marketeers, and startup enthusiasts, just like all of you across the globe. 
uh, we hold regular meetups in San Francisco, Korea, Copenhagen, Bangalore, Delhi um, in person as well. And uh, all our content that we share and when we invite speakers is all available on our microsite, which I would uh, recommend that you visit. It's called indicode.inmobi.com. So moving on to today's webinar, which is titled Winning Strategies for Glowing Global. Uh, just a little bit about why we're here today. So building a global, globally successful business from India is not simple. And very few organizations have been able to achieve success at scale. The challenges range from understanding global audiences, user acquisition tactics, and localizing app content to suit global palettes. Today, during our webinar, we will be sharing some insights about what app developers and mobile marketers need to keep in mind while building their global expansion plans. We have two speakers today. The first speaker is going to be Pramod Rao, who's SPP Growth at Somato. Uh, Pramod is currently responsible for international expansion and growth at Somato. He has been part of Somato's growth from the early days and has worked on social media marketing and growth strategies for the company. We're very excited to have Pramod on board with us. And uh, of course, I'll, I'll be taking on the second part of the webinar today. As I shared, um, I work within Mobi in the marketing team and head marketing for India and Southeast Asia. Just a little bit about the structure of our webinar today. It will be hosted in two parts. We will start with Pramod, who will share some of his learnings and experiences as Zomato went about their global expansion. And later, I will step in to give a few examples and insights from different other different business segments, such as gaming, social, messaging, O2O businesses, and talk about some factors to consider while you're building, while you are considering go, going global. I will also spend some time on in Mobi success globally, deep diving into the Chinese market as an example and what, what in Mobi was able to do in China that has made us successful over there. So that's, uh, you know, through with the introductions, I'm going to hand over to Pramod now. Just very quickly in terms of quick housekeeping, uh, you can type in questions into the chat window. Both of us, uh, both Pramod and I will take up questions after our sessions. So handing over to Pramod to begin. Hello. Yes, Pramod can hear you. Just shifting my screen. Um, are you guys able to see the screen? Just raise your hands and let me know if it's working fine. Um, thanks, Sophia, for the introduction. Moving to um, Zomato's context, I think um, a quick introduction. Um, so we've been there about like close to eight years now, and um, it started out in 2008 in Delhi NCR, um, first as a part-time idea back in Bayonet Company when we started off as a menu menus aggregator of, of restaurants around us. So that was the initial idea to be able to provide uh, information to users to be able to decide which restaurant they want to go to or order in from. So we built that in India till about 2012 and um, went on to become a, more of a social discovery platform, providing rich information for each and every restaurant that's out there uh, to be able to help users uh, make informed choice about where they want to go and have dinner or like lunch or order in whenever they would want to. So that you know from that was 2012 when we were only focused in India, and that's when we decided to move to uh, Dubai as the first international city and test the waters there and see you know if this concept, which uh, worked very well in the 10 cities we were in in, in India at that point, um, would that work in an international market as well? Um, and so on. You know we saw this product being required or there's a product market need um, that we identified in several other geographies which we sort of made it a plan that okay we would identify geographies which make sense for us to enter into and uh, to be able to customize our product 
to win the market once we end it. So it wasn't a spray and pray approach which um, we've taken in the last um, three and a half or years. Um, what started out initially as a trial and error, um, there I'll walk through what is the thought process, how did we choose the countries that we expanded into and what gets us to be here and present in 23 countries, 10,000 plus cities, covering about 1.4 million restaurants as of today. So the slide that you're seeing currently sort of shows, uh, shows you how we progressed over the years. Um, 2012, Dubai was the first city that we moved into. We launched Sri Lanka as well. And um, we, we used to pick at that point, you know, our approach to international expansion was, A, let's uh, look at markets which are English speaking, which are similar to, you know, the operations that we've experienced so far um, in India. And figure out what would it take for us to build our business and also grow our app in a location that's you know, that we are not that we are new to. Um, I think UK happened around that time, which was a bold move, um, kind of ridiculous also. Uh, you know, when we look back, it started out as a joke, but um, I think it was more about taking a leap of faith. And um, we launched London in January 2013 with about 14,000 restaurants, literally about like 30 of us uh, walking the streets in London for three, four weeks, uh, collecting restaurant information in the cold and rain. And you know, we applied what worked in India, um, our data collection process in London, and um, launched in January. 2013 was great for us. I think we learned a lot, and a lot of our approach that I've mentioned on the right-hand side is completely from our learnings from that year. And uh, we realized that the best way to go about launching in a market is one having the local team on the ground. So both in Dubai and UK. Um, our approach was uh, to start off with a team that that's probably got no market knowledge. So, for example, I spent about a year in UK, um, you know, building the operations. But it took some time to understand the nuances of what changes would be needed in a product, what localization um, um, would need to be incorporated, or what kind of features need to be uh, incorporated to win the market. It took some time to get to that. The other approach was to probably hire a local team up front, both um, from a leadership point of view and the core team, you know, be it content, marketing, and sales, to be able to go to market as quickly as possible with the right product. Right? So I think product market fit is very essential uh, when you look at your app strategy, as in the same things that got you to be successful in one market will not get you to be successful in another. So it's very important to have uh, local leadership, local teams giving you inputs from time to time uh, to be able to have the right content and product as well. So 2013, you know, we um, the, the the early part of 2013, we identified markets where we were comfortable in the sense that it would be English-speaking markets, uh, probably um, smaller sized, but uh, having about two three local players, um, which had lack of structured data. Um, so where we knew that, okay, we could go and bring like structured content as the USP and build on from there. Um, that moved to the later part of 2006, 2013 where we started experimenting with bilingual markets. So um, that's, I think for apps that are looking to localize in terms of language, it is quite a tedious process to do so. Um, so we, we did everything in-house um, right from data collection in the local language to um, ensuring that every string on our website or the app has a local um, translation and the context is also maintained. The 2013 sort of you know paved the way for us to ensure so a we need, we understood what what it would take to build um, a business and also grow. You know, what, it, uh, what should we be doing in terms of growth uh, when you look at app growth or like you know website and you know, web traffic in markets which are English speaking and non-English speaking as well. Moved to 2014, we started hitting some big markets, um, especially when you look at Canada, uh, look at markets like uh, I think Portugal or even the um, European markets, which um, would not have been easy if we had 
not had the context of 2012-2013, you know, where we spent uh, our time organically expanding into those markets and learning from our mistakes and making iterations to our approach. Uh, 2014 was the later half of 2014 was when we started looking at um, organic versus inorganic models. So a very simple thing was we would do a market analysis, um, and which I'll cover in the next slide, and figure out what would it take for a like you know to understand whether Zomato is there a need for Zomato in the market. Second, if there is a need for Zomato, what are the customizations that would be required for us to win the market? And when I say win the market, A, from the consumer standpoint, right? And um, there, there needs to be enough demand for users um, to use the product in the sense we should have enough content, uh, enough restaurant content, and um, the, uh, the rich data that we provide should be um, and there have been markets where we've rejected as well, where we said, okay, maybe not the right time to do, um, you know, probably look at it later. So then what happens is, you know, let's say you decide into a market, like for example, Czech Republic. Um, you realize that daily menus is something that's very unique to Czech Republic and Slovakia as well. And then you wouldn't find this anywhere where a restaurant changes their um, daily menus. Um, during lunch, so these are subsidized menus which change every week. So today's menu and the next week's menu is not going to be the same. So we needed to have a product which uh, would be able to show um, changing menus and how our content operations work is uh, we collect menus from a restaurant, scan them, and we ensure that on average uh, once every three months we go and update by actually visiting the, each and every restaurant in the city. So every day we are hitting about, each person is hitting about 50, 60 restaurants and over a period of three months we cover the entire uh, city and that's the earlier approach that we had. Um, that would not have been possible with a daily changing menu. So we looked at what's out there, how are people, you know, deciding to go to restaurants, how do they decide and we identified lunchtime and Obedovat as a local product which had real, literally market dominance in the space. So it made sense, you know, we spoke to them. Um, and they had good teams as well, good products, and the product fit in very well with our vision and you know what we were trying to achieve in the discovery space for dining out and ordering it. So we combined the two, you know, we acquired both the products and uh, transitioned the um, merchants, the merchant data, and also the users onto our platform. And now you see the localization in Czech Republic. So there's a section for daily menus, which you'll not find it in any other city. Like you know, if you go to Prague. Um, you'll find a daily menu section, you won't see that in Delhi, um, but these are things that you need to identify when you're looking at each and every market, so it can't be one model fits all. 2015, um, so was completely focused on, I think, acquisitions and like in, in, in some of the very critical markets, so we looked at um, you know, further expansion in Europe, so that was on the agenda, so Poland and Italy both had uh, players who had good products solving the problem, discovery problem, and we felt that you know we should integrate the teams for that. Urban Spoon acquisition happened around the same time, so the discussion started around December 2014, and we completed the acquisition early 2015. Um, Urban Spoon had a model where um, you know they had a great product. You know they launched; they were in fact one of the first apps to launch with the iPhone. Um, and um, they the completely community driven uh, product and you know they had a team of 40 in Seattle um, they had market leadership in Australia uh, they had about 90 percent mind share there um, they had market leadership in Canada and they were the number two player in the US so for us Australia was always on the cards but we did not have the bandwidth of the resources at that time to launch it organically Plus, competing against a player with a monopoly uh, in the search and discovery space would require significant amount of time for us as well. So, similar approach in Canada, where we already had a small presence, but it made complete sense for us to um, you know, look at an acquisition with um, where, with respect to Urban Spoon. So, if I had to summarize here, yeah, the three things I think local teams um, is very critical. Um, you know, right from day one, you need to have local inputs to adapt your product to the market and second is customizing the product at the right time I think uh, that's a constant uh, process you, you know at Zomato we keep uh, our app updates as 
frequent as possible. We keep changing, um, you know, to keep up with times. It's not going to be, um, you know, one layout forever kind of a scenario. So we interact with our users almost on a daily basis, um, not just on emails, but also we have like community managers in all the cities reaching out and speaking to them, and uh, incorporating the feedback uh, back into the product. So customizations like widgets, which Urban Spoon had used really effectively with bloggers, uh, daily menus in Prague, zip code search in the UK, um, you know, having partnerships with OpenTable, for example, in the UK back then, and so on. So uh, really the key to be able to build stickiness to your product for the market. And second is, uh, the third point is focus on user engagement and the content that they generate, new user acquisition. So we've also always maintained that, you know, without search and discovery, um, you know, ensuring that people are coming onto our platform, consuming, engaging, and creating content on our platform, nothing would work out. So be it for a search and discovery is um, very, very much the bread and butter, I would say, for looking into um, the overall ecosystem of communication, uh, communicating with restaurants, you know, be it online ordering, be it table reservations, um, everything is built on top of uh, search and discovery from our point of view. Um, in India as well, so, it, you know, we wanted the search and discovery piece to actually um, reach a point where uh, almost each and every user would come onto a platform and have discover restaurants or search for restaurants. And now we're focusing on making it as convenient as possible to communicate with the restaurants, be it placing an order online or, you know, reserve a table. And that's the approach that we've constantly followed. I think a strong focus on this approach has helped us scale um, in the last, you know, two years, nine months um, across 23 countries. Um, so I, if I had to summarize, like, how, what's the thought process on how do we choose markets? You know, is there a science behind it or do we just go out randomly? Um, I think um, there are four or five factors over time which we have realized are very critical. Um, when we were expanding in, in the initial phase, probably we didn't look into all of these factors, but somehow dots connected over time. So one is, of course, product market fit. What we do, um, and for product market fit, is actually do an extensive user and merchant study. So not just through secondary research, we actually visit the market. So for example, Malaysia, the most recent market that we uh, entered into, in, I think last September. About a year ago, I had visited Malaysia for, a, uh, for, about, for about a week. And my agenda was very simple. I go out every day, meet, um, about three users who are blogging about restaurants or talking about restaurants on social media, try and understand, you know, what's the user behavior? You know, what's, um, how do they discover restaurants? Um, are there existing products that solve the need? Um, what would they ideally like in a discovery or search product? And similarly with merchants as well, figure out, you know, how do they reach out to their customers? Uh, what are the pain points? Um, and Try to think of how our product solves or does it solve, is there a need for our product? If it does solve, what are the changes we need to make for that market? So pretty much the product market fit exercise should come out with a yes or no, which says that yes, we will enter this market. Um, and then the approach would be the next step you know, the, to follow. Product land landscape is also very critical. So there will be a, uh, markets which will have two or three local players um, sometimes the local players might have significant market share, for in the case of Czech Republic and Poland, um, or they could be two or three players with not so much of user, not so much user adoption. Similar to South Africa, where there is eat out or uh, dine out, um, both players are uh, fairly small. There's lack of structured information in the market in general. So, um, we need to look at you know how the market uh, is being served correctly. And of course, the most critical, I think, is market potential and steady state economics. So you know, what does it mean to enter the market and gain B2C dominance or like, you know, get all of the users to discover through a platform? Does it translate to um, you know, healthy economics when you look at, look at it from a business point of view? Do you see merchants um, you know, looking at a product and probably investing in it um, to reach out to these users? 
um, how will the steady state economics look like for just a, as a standalone startup business at you know let's say jo in Johannesburg um, as a business you know will will we reach a stage where we can say the economics works out for us in the long run? This combined, I mean, these three factors combined with uh, macro factors. When I say macro factors, it would be: um, is it easy to do business in the market? You know, how easy is it to set up and scale? Um, the ease of execution sort of overlaps there, but the ease of execution I'm referring to um, has uh, an overlap with business factors as macro factors as well, and also resources available to us. So we could have started Australia back when we launched the UK market as well. But we literally did not have bandwidth to take on two really big markets. Um, so we parked Australia till the time of its spoon opportunity knocked our doors. Right? Let me take two examples of um, you know organic versus inorganic. How does it work out? So the UAE, the first market that we entered into back in 2012, um, so September 2012 was when we launched Dubai, um, and before that we were actually considering Singapore as one of the markets to look into. But um, I think Dubai came out to be the more favorable one because of the uh, rich data that we were able to get from the market. So we noticed that there were only two or three existing products in the market, but there was no mar major market leader. So none of them had a majority share, um, and in the listings business. Um, it's sort of a winner takes all kind of scenario. So, you know, when you see a fragmented market with two or three products, there's still um, a scope for entering and adding structure to the content that's out there. Right? So, we saw a strong market potential as well. We spoke to the users and also the merchants. Seemed like this, there was a lack of um, structured content or like a product that would aggregate um, and sort of become the communication layer between users and merchants. And um, uh, given that, that, that there's a high, um, let's say, percentage of population there which would stay, I mean, the expat community there would be there for a year or two, um, the uh, eating out propensity is very high in Dubai. And uh, for us, from an ease of execution point of view, and not just from, um, you know, familiarity with the uh, city and also having a network of, you know, folks who we knew who we can uh, start off word of mouth initially. It made complete sense to start off with Dubai for us and, uh, and do it organically instead of going through an acquisition route. You know, compare that to Australia, completely different scenario. There's definitely two or three existing products there. Urban Spoon had been there for about seven years or so and they had 90% mind share. Um, they had a very good product all of the influencers in all of the big cities were using this product and it would be very difficult to get into the market um, and when you're looking at the market there are five cities and 40,000 restaurants overall. Um, organically it would have taken us easily about two to three years to even make a dent in one of the markets there. Right? So uh, our assessment was that you know, we can Either go organically when we have bandwidth, you know, from UK and other markets, or look at this acquisition. You know, uh, Urban Spoon also did not have a team on ground in Australia, so it was great that they built an amazing product. I think um, for us, it made complete sense to actually merge their their traffic, their content onto our platform, and use our business model of the community-driven marketing, getting you know, speaking to the users and getting them on board reaching out to merchants, figuring out where the pain points and then helping solve the problems, it fit in perfectly. Right? So very different approaches. Um, the Australia launch was completely different also from how uh, we launched the market. It, there was a good six month transition phase. Uh, with acquisitions um, or inorganic growth, it's very critical to A, decide whether you want to migrate the product onto your platform or not. Um, second, the choice is that you, you let Urban Spoon as a brand stay and as a product also. And um, the restriction that we had on our side was there are a lot of features that we roll out globally and it would be very difficult to maintain different versions of uh, products for different countries. So it made sense for us 
to take the short term hit in traffic and ensure that we grow it back within a period of let's say a couple of months and but then merge everything onto our platform and let uh, and sort of ruthlessly focus on communication both on the users and merchant side to ensure the transition is very smooth. Nobody wants to like you know use one app um, forever and then the next day come back and see the app completely change. Um, it always happens that in the short term a lot of the users actually um, feel the shock of you know what's just happened but with Melbourne for example uh, I spent about four months there um, literally in the, from the first day it was all about reaching out to the top 200, 300 contributors, uh, the loyal contributors on Urban Spoon, understanding how they were using Urban Spoon, letting them know that you know there's a plan to transition Urban Spoon onto Zomato, and asking them what they would like to see. You know what were the features they liked, what what are the features they did not like on, on Urban Spoon, and how um, we can incorporate it on Zomato. Right. So we incorporated the key features like Spoonback. Um, some of the collections, right now we have user collections on Zomato, all of these are features which Urban Spoon had implemented really well. So drastically different approaches, I think uh, um, organically um, it's, a, it's a pretty set approach in the sense that you know, A, you need to get uh, focus on content, so get the content on board uh, by visiting all the restaurants and then start reaching out to community and then you know build it from there. In the inorganic uh, situation it's slightly different because you're going to transition an existing product onto your platform so um, and, you, and in cases with like Czech Republic and Poland we were also transitioning teams so from completely different roles on what they were doing before into uh, what our business model looks like. So in Czech Republic we had a two three month phase where we slowly moved over the roles and mapped people to what um, uh, the roles we had and um, it, it is quite di a different approach so one needs to be very sure that you need to go the inorganic route. Um, if you go the inorganic route you should be willing to probably look at uh, a, a easy four six months transition phase um, if it's a you know product like an orbit spoon that you're integrating on as a matter. So um, the approach in international markets, I think it's, this is relevant with any city um, um, of building it over time. I think the point that I want to make here is, uh, is we divide our uh, international operations over time um, based on the stage of the market. So the, each stage has a single-minded focus or let's say when I say single-minded focus, for example, the first three months, it's all about product market fit and sort of localizing content is a part of that. And the worry is not about, you know, are we making revenue the first three months? You know, that uh, that will not be sticky revenue if you don't have product market fit. So the first three months is all about understanding what would it take for us to, um, you know, if you've decided that, okay, this market, there is a need for some matter. Uh, what would it take for us to create a product or the content um, that users will users and merchants will adopt? Uh, once we have that in place, um, um, we then focus strongly on early adopters and community-driven marketing. This literally would mean that you, know, you uh, for example, in Lisbon, uh, we used to invite one user, uh, whoever came on our platform and started interacting with our product, we would invite people who are most active into our office, get them to meet our teams, get them to feel that they are part of some um, part of uh, the process of building our app, right? So the community driven marketing is one of the strongest ways I think to, of driving word of mouth and um, it's also critical that you know, beyond our own networks we are reaching out to the early adopters in the market um, identifying the similar to what we did in Malaysia, identifying the top 200 users um, or the first users who we want to try out our product and getting their feedback and incorporating that. Um, post that, we gun for critical mass of users and user generated content. So um, I don't know if you noticed on Twitter on Jan 30th, um, all of us were on a stickering drive. You know, um, in Delhi, about 200 of us went around on, on Saturday and 7,000 restaurants. 
and this is about reviewers um, on Zomato stickers. So it's a great way to reach out to merchants, talk about Zomato, tell them what our platform is all about, you know, in case the merchant doesn't know. Um, and uh, we ensure that our, our most relevant audience uh, is, I mean, based, our most relevant audience is the one that is going to the restaurants. So ensuring that there is a communication for uh, to ensure that that audience is coming and trying our platform is a, the best way to go about um, marketing in a new in a new city right? versus opening the tap on ad dollars. User generated con content is also very critical. So the worst thing that can happen is you know for example in 2008 it used to happen to me on Twitter so I tweet but then there's nobody retweeting. So um, for like a year or so, I did not actively use Twitter. But imagine if somebody, you know, my first tweet we received, let's say, ten retweets at that point, and the product was actually working very well. Um, I would keep coming back to it, right? So today, like Twitter has grown on to be a uh, a very social, highly interactive uh, medium, and that takes time. So our focus is also to ensure that over time we are getting um, a lot of users to use our product, consume content, engage with that content, and also create content. So creation of content is also very important. Um, so creation and engagement on a platform, once that starts taking place, it's uh, figuring out how do we get that to a critical mass. And once that happens, you know that as a social discovery platform um, on the consumer side, you're, you've got a product that um, every user in the market is able to relate to. Right? Only post that does it make sense to look at um, you know, monetization or strategic partnerships um, from purely from a 200 percent focus. So all of these four points happen parallelly, but it's more about what uh, lever do you push, push more at what stage of the market. Um, and this is sort of the sequence in which we've seen that uh, works best across markets. And if you try different approaches, there have been markets where they focus too heavily on revenue without actually having a product market fit. And all we saw is that um, the revenue we were getting was not sticky. Right? So um, to summarize, yeah, I think um, these are the slides that I had. So quick point, I think organic versus inorganic is completely a call based on uh, the six factors that I mentioned, so there's the product landscape, there's um, the product market fit, um, market potential and unit, unit economics at steady state, the macro factors, um, ease of execution and resources available to you. Uh, based on that, you would able to take a call of going the organic route, which um, is the best way to go about in any market, but you need to be conscious about the time and the cost that you know um, you live up. And the inorganic route, um, if you come across great teams and great products that are already solving this problem, it's a call between do you want to um, go grow the app against, um, let's say, a monopoly kind of a player, or do you want to work with them? Right. That's it from my side. Um, over to you, Supriya. Thanks so much, uh, Pramod. We do have a few questions if you want to. Let's take a look at those. Um, do you want to answer them now or probably after your presentation? No, it's okay. We'll go with your uh, questions right now, Pramod. Okay. Cool. Let me just take a look. Mm -hmm. um, so let me take the. This is a good question, I think. So did inorganic or acquisition markets turn successful, and how did Smarter handle some post acquisition? Uh, first part, let me answer it. I think, uh, I think uh, we, we made eight acquisitions. Of them, about six of them are running very well. The other two are on track to actually hit that. Right? Um, so let's take Australia, for example. It's been um, close, to, close to a year and about two months now. And um, when I went, like in a Jan 2015 retrieve with zero employees, had about uh, 10 restaurants um, advertising on Zomato. Um, the Urban Spoon traffic and reviews um, was what you know we had acquired at that point. Uh, to today, we we have a team of about 150 primarily sales content. We're seeing 
really good revenue growth. We have close to, I think, 600 advertisers there at the moment. Um, the merchants, and this is just Melbourne and Sydney, and we are now expanding our operations in Brisbane, um, Perth, and Adelaide as well. So uh, I think Australia is one such market, one such market which actually took off really well post acquisition. The traffic has held on, and now it's growing further. So the first three four months, we actually saw the traffic take a short dip, and and even in terms of let's say reviews. But the exercise that we did uh, of ensuring the first four months we spent a lot of time um, meeting the users and the merchants actually helped us get back. Um, and, you know, ensure that you know we are there. Uh, on you know retain the urban spool traffic and grow from there. Right? So on the second part of the question, I think um, Czech, Czech Republic would be ideal, and Czech Republic is doing great from a consumer point of view at the moment. We are um, working on getting the business side of things up and running, um, and uh, it is in a stage where I think right now we we want to be getting the critical mass of users and user engagement, user generated content. And only after that will we do a 200% push on monetization. Um, the user-generated content bit is um, critical there because the product lunchtime was completely menu consumption product. So it was only daily menus. There was no user content. So we are actually changing the behavior uh, in the market, and that takes time. And typically, when we organically launch as well, it takes us a year to reach a stage of B2C dominance or like critical mass of users and a year after that is when we usually break even. So you know, if you look at lunchtime or like Czech Republic right now, we're in the phase of hitting critical mass of user generated content and then we'll focus on growing monetization. The teams um, work a fair, I mean these are small teams that you know it is easier you know, we haven't I think um, acquired two large teams as well so far. But um, the mapping had to happen in a very phased manner. So the first one, the first couple of weeks post acquisition, we spent a lot of time. So Dipinder himself, like our founder, was um, spent about a week there, ensuring that everyone had context on what Zomato does, you know, how we've operated, pretty much give an overview of our approach, which I discussed so far, and work very closely with each and every member who would move on to Zomato or what they would be doing. You know, get them involved with the building process. I think the best way to handle teams post acquisition is to get them involved from day one in the transition phase, right? So just the act of let's say all of us getting together and spending literally two three weeks of going out on the streets and getting the restaurant information um, worked very well in building the team bonding and also them having an idea of how Zomato is built from scratch, right? So that's what's worked for us in terms of handling teams post acquisition. Right? The role clarity must be um, something that needs to be very clear to the uh, the team you're acquiring. And second is ensuring that you get to know the team on a personal level as well. Um, I don't think um, it's a organic or inorganic way. So the question is, how do you know to go organic or inorganic way of marketing? Um, I don't think the approach is more from a marketing point of view. Uh, what we discussed was from um, the, the operations point of view, like you know, whether acquisition is, uh, how do you decide on acquisition as a means to enter a market. Um, and those six metrics is literally, you know, the result of that is what we're telling. Right? How do you decide the marketing mix of app discovery? Does it vary by country? Yeah. So for us, um, I don't think it varies largely by country. Uh, a lot of the uh, things that I mentioned, I think our approach to growth in international markets, it's a very community driven uh, form of app discovery or marketing that we do. Um, what has really worked for us, I think, if uh, when we look at marketing is there are three major points. Um, we look at effort, cost, and impact. So uh, constantly we're trying to do low cost, low effort, high impact activities. And things like um, stickers on every restaurant door, ensuring that merchants are, um, merchants know about Zomato and they're talking about Zomato or like, you know, they are educated about our platform uh, is very critical. 
and um, this happens across all markets. You know, we have 2,200 folks uh, across 23 countries now, um, 18 of which we are market leaders in search and discovery. And um, the app discovery, apart from what you can do on the app store, optimize it, or like you know, um, use mobile web to drive downloads. I think beyond that, it it needs a word of mouth and a community driven strategy, especially when you know that you're facing app. Um, Pramod, I think I'll uh, uh, take yeah. it up now, and if we have more time towards the end, we'll definitely answer more questions uh, as well. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to change the presenter. Okay, so thanks so much, uh, Pramod, for those uh, very interesting and deep insights about what has uh, worked at Zomato for you. Um, you know, now I'll just spend about a quick seven, eight minutes uh, sharing some of the insights across different business models. These are around gaming, social messaging, online to offline, and uh, B2B as well. So to start with, uh, in terms of social message, social space or messaging space. So at a very macro level, conceptually, it may seem pretty easy to scale from a technology perspective uh, when if you're building a social app or a messaging app. But the reality is that the space is very, very cluttered. And eventually, uh, the market starts consolidating towards the top three uh, apps in every um, market or category. So for example, if you look at uh, what's what's happening in India and some of the Southeast Asian regions, in India you might have Facebook, WhatsApp and Hike sort of as the dominant three uh, players in this space. Uh, in China it's clearly WeChat, in Japan it's Line, in Korea it's Kakao, uh, not, not Line what's mentioned on the slide here. Uh, and therefore if you are working on a social or a messaging app uh, uh, and you're looking at going outside outside India or going global, it is extremely important to identify a unique uh, value proposition or do some niche targeting. So for example, you can have you know, um, something like Foursquare, uh, location-based network, so very, very niche. Uh, B2B messaging apps, uh, basically uh, there, was, uh, there was an app founded by, uh, by the Directi founder by uh, Bhavin Turakia, which is in the B2B messaging space. So very, very different space where uh, you know, you're creating a unique value proposition. Uh, goes without saying, and I think Pramod highlighted this fairly uh, um, specifically as well, that uh, the app needs to be localized based on cultural nuances in each market. And I will dive dive a little deeper on some of these localization trends that we see, especially in China in the gaming market. Um, another thing that uh, you know did want to share an example is that one can't really ignore offline marketing, just like I think what Pramod was mentioning as well, to uh, when you're looking at really your initial um, uh, bootstrapping for the user network for social apps. And this is just an example. Uh, GroupMe is another uh, messaging app based in the U. And um, in the US, big events and conferences such as SXSW, which happens in Austin, are extremely popular uh, where you start really looking at, um, uh, you know, that's where uh, the early adopter community lies. And uh, so what GroupMe did was in a fairly crowded space, they, I mean, it's it's just a simple uh, offline marketing step, but they, they set up a grilled cheese food truck and that became the most popular, uh, you know, post in um, SXXW this year in Austin. They had done this earlier in 2011 as well, but even this year it worked for them. It helped them get that initial traction which they needed. So for instance, in India, we don't, we haven't really seen uh, some of these examples uh, step in, but these have worked for in other markets. So moving on to the online to offline space, uh, clearly here there are three or four factors which are uh, extremely uh, critical. Number one, this is a very, very difficult business to scale and the challenges, uh, the biggest challenges is around the regulatory framework. And uh, even if you look at an example like Uber, um, to 
to sort of address the challenges of the regulatory framework as they are expanding in not only in India but across the globe, um, they might be adopting sort of two techniques. Once is, one is a very expensive technique, influencing regulators. Um, I, I think I, I, you know, there, there is some some case around the fact that Uber had actually hired um, a big, um, uh, you know, a, a person from Obama's campaign uh, to as a as a regulator influencer to influence the regulator even in the U.S. when they were starting up. Uh, they have also the other option for them is to create a lot of public support for the kind of work that they are doing so that then the public sort of influences the uh, the regulatory framework so it's it's a it's a challenging space to be in definitely local partnerships are sometimes very important um, and promote spoke in detail about these um, Operational support, local hires to run the business become important here again in the case of Uber, blah, 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 we see that happening. And uh, I wanted to share an example of Airbnb and also, you know, um, to share that basically some of the things are around scaling your business by doing, by doing things that don't scale in, in our minds, these don't typically scale. But the objective is to get it right with the first 100 customers in each market. So Airbnb, actually, when they were starting off, the founders went almost went door to door with flyers and to speak about Airbnb. It was it was a it, it was a new it's it was a sharing economy. People really didn't get it. You were placing your houses in the trust of another person. Other people were going to be living in your houses, and they had to do a lot of effort initially to uh, in the community. Um, to you know to gain to gain confidence and trust and one of the approaches that they followed is that they just looked at adopting users uh, at you know an increase of 10% every week and let's say you have 100 users in the beginning and at the end of week one you have 110 and that seems a small number but if you stay committed to that goal of 10% a week into in a year you will actually have around 2 million users uh, so the point being that uh, you know, it's it's hard, and founders, marketers really need to get their hands dirty while building the online to offline space. So I'm moving on to some insights uh, on the gaming uh, space and and what works globally. The reason that we're focusing, I'm focusing a little bit more on China in this um, in this space in in this dimension of gaming is that China is the hardest market to beat. Uh, you know, and to, to be successful in when it comes to gaming. Um, I think Pramod also spoke about localization, but clearly, especially in gaming, localization is not simply just about translation. So if you look at even the ecosystem for gaming in uh, China versus the Western countries, it's extremely fragmented across distribution, payment partners, and discovery partners. So if I'm just going to run through a few examples. So if you look at App Store promotions, unlike uh, in Google Play for games monetizing through in-app purchases, the App Stores in China offer promotions in exchange for revenue share. And because of the extremely fragmented um, um, you know, ecosystem and multiple App Stores in China, it really becomes important to pick and sure, choose the right App Store to promote your game in. Secondly, in terms of uh, game centers and social apps, so social mes messaging in China is more like a platform, uh, and platforms like WeChat and QQ are also into game distribution through their game centers, and therefore to maximize uh, your users, and uh, you need to actually publish your game in the popular social game centers in China as well. Um, and then moving on to you know further nuances of what localization sort of works in China, and these are just some examples. So the first example, if you look at uh, you know the endless runner game and how it is in in the West, it's it's a more vertical format, darker, more realistic themes. But in China, uh, you know typically you have horizontal formats. It's not in perspective. Uh, light and colorful themes is is what works. Even if you look at characters and in-game graphics, uh, typically uh, in the West, what has worked for games in the past is human characters, again more realistic. Whereas in China, it's more fantasy, animated, uh, cartoon characters, and uh, definitely on gameplay complexity as well. Again, here's just a simple example that, for example.
example, in the West, you might have a game where the puzzle, uh, you know, it's a simple puzzle game, but you are restricted in terms of the number of moves that you can make. Whereas in China, it will be a very simple uh, format, same, simple gameplay, and uh, the restriction will be in terms of time and not in terms of uh, number of moves. So it's like a 60 second, very quick, uh, you know, quick turnaround of, of games. So here I just, you know, I just wanted to give a few other uh, insights into, um, you know, what, what works in other parts of the world and different businesses. And uh, just, um, you know, to, as a last uh, few quick minutes on um, what has worked for Inmobi in China and very quickly in terms of context, as a mobile adver uh, advertising company, there was no way that actually we could choose to not play in China. Uh, it's the country with the largest smartphone user base, number two economy in the world. Also, uh, the market is even today really fast growing, not only in terms of economic growth and smartphone user base, but also on uh, mobile internet. And Smartphone users in China are very mobile first as well. Uh, more users access the internet through their mobile phones than the PC. And this mobile first approach actually presents a very dynamic opportunity for mobile players like uh, in Mobi and for, for others uh, on, you know, on, on this webinar as well. And users have sort of moved their consumption completely to mobile so that so that so much so that even the payment infrastructure in the country is dominated by mobile wallets. They are far ahead of uh, India in terms of mobile wallets. And uh, considering the fact that the GDP of the country is far bigger, uh, smartphone users in China could contribute much higher ARPU, which is average revenue per user value than smartphone users in India. So basically, you know, looking at all of this, all of these points, um, it was sort of critical for in Mobi to be successful there. Uh, this is not to say that challenges don't exist. Uh, uh, that you know the country is infamous for its censorship and strict regulations and uh, China has actually so far kept even the US giants such as Google and Facebook away except there are some exceptions like Apple or Uber and Starbucks but it really hasn't been an easy ride for them so in in all of this context what really worked for Inmobi and I'm just sharing uh, you know points around four four key dimensions so in terms of technology, I think when we were building a product, our approach was to always think global. So we sort of built a minimum viable product right from the beginning, which was global in its outlook. Only after we had established market potential and scale have we started looking at localization of technology uh, and the product solutions that we offer in China. Second, there's always an interesting question around how to enter China. Uh, should it be a JV uh, versus uh, yourself? And there are pros and cons. Through a JV, you get complete direct entry. You understand the market very quickly. But you lose independence and flexibility. And uh, in Mobi, clearly took a decision to, uh, you know, to not enter through a JV. Um, um, we entered independently. And that has given us the independence and flexibility which we believe is has been critical to our success at, in China today. In terms of talent, definitely local leadership is critical. It's hard to succeed in China by um, sending leaders from other parts of the world uh, because the context is really you know, complex and different from most other parts of the world. And definitely deep understanding of local norms. Communication is very top down. It is hierarchical. There are very nuanced, um, you know, cultural dimensions uh, in China, which, which I think that we were, we, as in Mobi, we were able to address through the local leadership that we had in place over there. So broadly, that's very quickly what I had. I know we are at uh, three thirty, which is uh, um, time. So. Pramod, if uh, you want to take maybe one or one more question, and we'll have to sort of end now. I'm sorry, but uh, you know, just in case so some of you uh, choose to, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for joining our webinar, and we will definitely share content in the next uh, few days with you as well. Um, 
do visit the indico.inmobi.com microsite to stay updated on upcoming events. But Pramod, I think we can take maybe one more question. We are at 3.30. Yeah, I, I'll actually just take two quickly. One I've sort of already answered in one of the uh, questions before. So on the market share uh, for acquisition. So the question is, do you look at market share with, uh, market share for acquisition or how do you handle acquisition business models that's valuable but different from ours. So we've actually done both. So we've done seven acquisitions uh, to enter or gain market share and two have been product acquisitions, completely different business models. So one is in the table reservation space and um, that is a complementary business model for us and uh, the other is in the POS space. So each is handled differently and I think our Czech Republic model is also slight diff slightly different. Uh, from a business model point of view. So we do take into account that it, these acquisitions need to sit on top of our business model. Uh, let me quickly take the other question. So this is about food startups and hyper-local players who shut down shop post operations for less than 12 months. Why this sudden surge in recruiting people and growing business followed by sudden decay, closure of ventures and bulk employee force downsizing. I think um, most of the, um, you know, if you had to boil it down, there are two or three factors. One is, like I mentioned, the um, steady state unit economics or uh, keeping a close eye on how the unit economics works out is very critical for a business. And um, over the last six months, seven months, we've seen that um, a lot of the models which did not make sense from a per unit um, economics point of view were the ones that actually couldn't survive. And of course there was a market crash in China which sort of triggered everything and a lot of folks um, and we'll be talking about market correction happening and you know the startup space actually uh, being more cognizant of the business models. I think the ones that didn't work out were the ones didn't have, who didn't have a solid foundation or um, solid unit economics. Cool. Um, I, w I don't think we have time for the other questions but um, Please do email me at promote.zamara.com. I think I'll be able to take it anytime. Thanks so much, uh, Pramod, and thank you uh, to the audience as well. Feel free to reach out to uh, Pramod at promodatsumato.com or to me, supriya.goswami at inmovie.com if you have any feedback, any further questions. And thanks for being a great audience today. Cool. Thank you.